Good evening. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Mr. William McNabb, prominent investment banker and highly respond, uh, respected business leader. We are so happy to have him with us. And it is an absolute delight to see so many of you here this evening after the long absence we have had from one another. I know you're happy to be back on campus and we're happy to have you back on campus. I can't tell you how hollow the halls felt and the classrooms and every place else when you weren't here. So welcome back. I want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Rita Bazzillo and the business department and students who participated for arranging this lecture and providing the opportunity to benefit from the experiences of Mr. McNabb. In the midst of so many challenges that the faculty have had and the students have had, it really testifies to their commitment that they were able to put something like this together and see to all the logistics that made it necessary. This is one of the college's premier lectures. Over the years, we have invited prominent members of the business community to deliver a lecture that offered insight into their lives, decisions, and values as they acquired skills and competencies while climbing the proverbial corporate ladder. One lesson quickly learned by listeners is that success has a price and it is not achieved without a great deal of effort. Another important lesson these lecturers have taught us is that there's no success without a few failures. Indeed, some of the greatest learning is acquired from inadvertent missteps. It is the determination to keep on keeping on that ultimately decides whether you succeed or fail. Now, I understand from Dr. Borzillo that business students have indicated their interest in ethical leadership, including how to invest ethically and still make money. It's a good goal. It can be tempting to take shortcuts and to allow the desire to accumulate profit to be the driving force behind decisions. Ethical leaders take the long view and consider the common good over individual enrichment. Our choices matter. They determine not only who we are, but who we will be. What may seem a good decision in the short term, what may result in a windfall of cash, may well be disastrous in the long term. Instant gratification may be too high a price to pay when the consequences are conscientiously weighed and evaluated. Just consider the opioid debacle brought about by Big Pharma's greed, or by Big Oil's decision to deny the damage to the environment brought about by fossil fuel emissions. It may be less profitable to do what is right, but the cost of self-interest can ultimately be too high a one to pay. At Chestnut Hill College, we strive to make choices that will positively affect the dear neighbor. That is, all of our sisters and brothers on this planet. So that each person is guaranteed the freedoms and necessities required to live a meaningful and fulfilling life. As we gather this evening to benefit from the wisdom of Mr. McNabb, let us consider the good that can be promoted by business women and men committed to the betterment of others. Those who do what is good and choose what is right will ultimately be enriched by their choices, and so will the global community. And I know those values are in your hearts. So welcome and thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is David Schmidling. I'm a business administration and management major here at Chestnut Hill College. 
I'm also the captain of the men's golf team and I co-founded the business club and accounting club. Hello, my name is Madeline Jimenez. I'm double majoring in accounting and business here at Chestnut Hill. I'm also the captain of the women's soccer team and the co-founder of the accounting and business club. Maddie and I have been working diligently with the help of Professor Brazillo, and we are so excited for the Accounting and Business Club to become up and running after this year of COVID-19. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this amazing event. We first would like to thank Sister Carol, our president, Dougherty, our VPAA, and Dr. Meacham, as well as Dr. Green and other administration and faculty present here tonight. Without you, we would not be able to afford this outstanding educational opportunity. We are also so honored to welcome Mr. William McNabb to Chestnut Hill College. Mr. McNabb is the former CEO and chairman of Vanguard, the world's largest mutual fund manager. He joined Vanguard in 1986, and in 2008, he became chief executive officer, while later, in 2010, becoming chairman of the board of directors and board of trustees. During his time with Vanguard, the group's assets under management grew fivefold, and he led product innovation that helped position the company in becoming a world market leader. Since retirement, Mr. McNabb has taken on several non-executive roles, including the New York Stock Exchange, IBM, and the United Health Group, to name a few. He currently holds a position on the board of Tilney Smith and Williamson, a UK wealth management and professional services group as a non-executive director. Mr. McNabb is the oldest of five children, grew up in Rochester, New York, where he developed a love for competitive sports, including soccer and basketball. He earned a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and later an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania right here in Philadelphia. During his time at Dartmouth College, Mr. McNabb studied government and spent a lot of his free time rowing on a team that ranked among the top five in the US. Mr. McNabb says the team dynamic helped him develop his management style today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. McNabb as he shares his thoughts on investing and leadership. So I'm gonna remove this if that's okay. Um, otherwise, I don't think you guys will be able to hear me, so um, apologies. I'm multiple vaccinations and tests and all that kind of good stuff, so hopefully uh, everybody's safe. So um, it's a real privilege to be here, and I want to thank Rita uh, Borzillo for inviting me. She and I have known each other for a number of years, and it's you know sort of fun to come and do this. And I have to say, in two years, this is actually the first time I'm back live in front of a group, and uh, it's really, really gratifying to see you all here. And I think just given the numbers we have and everything that's going on, what I'm gonna try to do is, I've got a handful of slides to frame um, a few broad investment ideas, but then we're gonna just open it up and have a conversation and let you ask whatever you'd like to ask. And we can talk about the markets, we can talk about the economy, we can talk about life inside a corporation. Um, I also uh, have the privilege of being on the Philadelphia Zoo Board, so if you wanna talk about rhinos and orangutans in the wild, we can go there too. So, uh, you know, whatever you'd like. Um, and, and, you know, as, as I was thinking about this um, and, and how to frame uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about, I thought it would be helpful just to give a couple of minutes of background, which Maddie actually provided a lot of. Um, you know, she said, I grew up uh, in Rochester, New York. I was one of five kids, uh, probably the two big impact things on my life were playing sports um, with my brothers and you know just growing up in a very competitive uh, dynamic world there and then um, I uh, was mostly a public school kid uh, but I had a year before my family moved at a Jesuit high school where I got deeply deeply uh, infused with uh, how to write and the Latin language so uh, and for those of you um, who have studied religion and so forth. I go all the way back to having to learn the mass in Latin as an altar boy. So that's how long um, I've been at the Latin language. So uh, anyway, uh, I give you that as just background because um, one of the messages I hope you're gonna take away um, from what I talk about is path, there, there's no like one path 
to doing things in the business world. A lot of what uh, really drives success in the business world is taking the opportunities that are presented to you and then figuring out how to sort of make something of them that's a little bit different than uh, maybe was intended. And I'll keep coming back to that theme. But um, before I do that, I, I, I do want to, um, uh, you know, spend a little bit of time about the, with the markets. Um, you know, the story about how I got to Vanguard, uh, and, and I was talking to a couple of students beforehand, sometimes it's really, really um, beneficial to be lucky. And, and I'm the first one to admit how much luck I've had. Uh, I was, um, as an undergrad, as you heard, I was, I, I say I majored in political science or government at Dartmouth. I really majored in rowing and happened to go to school for government. Um, you know, we were a really competitive team. We spent a lot of time on the water and that was sort of what drove me. And when I was a senior in, in college, um, I wasn't really done competing, uh, from, at least from my perspective. And so I was trying to figure out what can I do where I could still compete and at the same time, you know, earn a living because I wasn't gonna, you know, I wasn't gonna be supported by anybody. So I, I had to figure that out. And I decided because I'd had such um, huge impact from a, a number of educators that I thought teaching and coaching might be a cool path to go. So I got a job teaching Latin of all things and coaching rowing. So my two loves sort of, you know, the two big impacts, sports and uh, learning the Latin language, if you will, came together. And, uh, you know, that little, that's about as much Latin, by the way, as I remember these days. So, um, you know, it was sort of a phrase that stuck with me because of the rowing, but that's what brought me to Philly. Um, I had never actually been to Philadelphia. I'd raced against a lot of Philadelphia crews and everybody said, you have to go to Boathouse Row if you want to be, you know, at the next level. So I came here to be a teacher and met my wife, you know, made all kinds of friends. And then it was really from there that I ended up going back to grad school, going to, you know, uh, majoring uh, in finance. And then I ended up on Wall Street, like 90% of Penn at the, in, in those days. And um, I was uh, enjoying working for what's now JP Morgan Chase, you know, one of the uh, legacy companies. And it was, you know, it was heady stuff. There was lots of really cool deals and so forth. Um, but I will, I will tell you, one of the things I didn't like about it was just the leadership at the bank at the time. It's a completely different group now and they've done a great job. But in, in my era, it just wasn't that great. Um, they did not set the best example in terms of how you treat each other and so forth. And I began to get kind of disgruntled and you know, wonder what was next. And then as fate would have it, I got this phone call from a friend of mine um, from Philadelphia who said, you know, you think, would you th ever think of leaving Wall Street and coming back to Philly? I said, yeah, uh, you know, my wife's from Philadelphia. We love Philadelphia. I would love to come back to this city. And um, he said, well, that's the good news. The bad news is it's a company you've never heard of. It's this little thing called Vanguard. And I said, what's a Vanguard? And he says, well, it's a mutual fund company. And I, of course, said, what's a mutual fund? Yeah, I had no idea. Um, you know, we were dealing with, you know, big transactions and M&A deals and so forth. And he said, look, it's this really cool startup. It's been in business a few years. Just come down and have a conversation with them. So I came down and uh, I met um, our founder, uh, Jack Bogle, who is an iconic figure in, in finance. And Jack, um, you know, proceeded to basically tell me why Wall Street was corrupt and that nobody should be working there. Um, Jack had strong opinions in those days. And, uh, but his real thing was he wanted to create a company that put the investor and the, the customer, if you will, first. And that was sort of his drive. So we, we had this great conversation and um, I ended up uh, going to see my old rowing coach in Philadelphia who said, you'd be crazy not to do this. Um, just, he sounds like a really interesting guy to work for. And so I came in at a very, you know, entry level and then, you know, had the opportunity to do a lot of other things. And if of interest, we can talk about that in Q&A. But what really kept me at Vanguard, because, you know, as we began to grow as an organization, um, you know, there was the pull to go back to Wall Street. We had you know, different people, you know, different friends of mine trying to recruit people out of Philly and back to New York. And the, the real thing that kept me was the core mission of the company. And, you know, it, it sounds really basic, but this idea of taking a stand for investors, treating them fairly, 
and then ac actually giving them the best chance to succeed that any company could give, that really resonated. And, and this sort of, this is the why, if you will, everybody comes to work at Vanguard, is this concept. And again, our founder, Jack Bogle, you know, one of his favorite phrases was, good ethics is good business. And that's where the whole treating people fairly came from. And we used to ask ourselves the question all the time, if any action we took showed up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, what would people think? And so every decision you made as a young uh, associate all the way up to, to the top executive ranks was around that concept. That if this is front page Wall Street Journal, are we proud of it or are we kind of hiding? And it became a real guidepost for us. So this concept of um, you know, the why, as I call it. And I would encourage you guys, by the way, as you go out into the business world and you look at different places, look at the mission statement and look at what it tr it's trying to do. If it explains what the company does or how the company does, probe a little bit about why the company thinks it has a right to exist. Because I think every mission statement should reflect the why an organization exists, not just the what you're trying to do. So um, this is really what kept me, and um, you know, it, it was uh, a phenomenal uh, experience. But the other thing that really kept me um, along with the mission was actually how we did it. Okay, you know, what did, what did, so how do you translate this into reality? Well, you know, um, the great Warren Buffett uh, likes to say, investing is simple, but it's not easy. And truer words were never spoken. Um, he, um, you know, Mr. Buffett has this concept of investing. When he explains it, it's very folksy. If you, any of you have heard him speak or read any of his writings, he's, you know, just incredibly down to earth and it all makes sense, but it's incredibly hard to actually go do. So what I'll try to do here is I'm gonna boil it down to sort of four basic principles. And these four principles are around goals, as you can see, balance, cost, and discipline. These are four things that you can control, both as a provider of service, but much more importantly, as an investor yourself. So you can control these four things. And it's control of these four things that determines success. So I'll try to walk through uh, each of them uh, briefly. So goals. This is actually the hardest one, believe it or not. You know, most people, when you say, what's your goal in investing? Well, I want to make money. Well, that's great. You know, we all, you know, we all want to put something into the market and see something bigger come out. But what, what are you really trying to achieve? And trying to figure that out, whether it's saving, saving for education, saving for retirement, just creating a rainy day fund, saving to buy that first house, saving for your kid's education, or some future idea of starting a business. Whatever it is, being very clear about that because understanding the goal actually helps determine how much risk you're willing to take and what kind of time frame you're willing to, you, you actually need to be ready for. So if I'm saving for retirement, well, I'm kind of there already, so that's a really short-term goal for me. But I look out in this audience, if you, I mean, the word retirement probably doesn't make any sense to you guys, right? You're thinking, I don't have to worry about that. But the great thing is if you're an investor and you're saving for retirement and you have a 40 year time horizon to that, that's a phenomenal amount of time. That allows you to do a lot of different things than if you're saving for something that you need the money tomorrow. So again, this is why this whole concept of goals is so key. And very importantly, you know, the last point here, you know, how do you react to different things? That's really trying to get at the, how much risk you're willing to take. So again, when I was your age and beginning to think about retirement and beginning to invest, I didn't care if the market went up or down. It made no difference. All I cared about was 40 years from that time, the mar I hoped the market was gonna be a lot higher than it was when I started. And that's a really important principle. Um, if I were saving for, you know, to buy a house next year, I'd have a very different time frame, and I wouldn't actually want to take a lot of risk because I wouldn't want my money to drop by 20% overnight if we had a correction in the stock market. So that's, again, just a simple example. So goals, you know, making sure that you really have a good sense of goals, really, really critical. You know, the second thing is balance. 
Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, of all the things, this, this is one of the two most difficult things for investors to understand. And it's the idea that the portfolio determines the return, not the individual selection of a stock or a particular fund. So how many guys here, have, have any of you uh, traded on Robinhood? We got a handful. All right, we're gonna chat. I, I wanna hear all about it you know, uh, afterwards. But um, you know, when you look at the Robinhoods, and in my day it was day trading through uh, TD Amer Ameritrade or Schwab or whoever, um, the whole idea was there are three or four stocks. If you can just pick the right one, you're gonna make a ton of money. Okay, you're gonna make a ton of money. Well, th that can be true, but what we have found over time is the performance of individual stocks tends to be pretty random over time. And when you look at an entire portfolio, what really determines the return is the mix between a broad basket of stocks, bonds, and cash. So as you can see from the chart there, 90% of the return is actually due to the portfolio construction. Only 10% is due to the individual securities you pick. Again, completely counterintuitive. I will tell you, my favorite investor in the whole world, it's not Warren Buffett, it's my mother. And my mom is approaching 90, and she's been a Vanguard client for 35 years now, and I can't get this, I can't get her to understand this. She still wants to talk about why, you know, ABC Company is a great buy right now. And I'm like, mom, that's great, but it really has nothing to do with what your overall portfolio is gonna look like, unless you put all your money in that one stock. And by the way, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about. When you put all your money in a single stock or a single fund, unless it's a broad-based fund, you can, you can go up a lot, but you can also go down a lot. And that's the whole idea. The more diversified you are, the more you dampen that amount of volatility. I'm gonna show you one example of that in a minute. So this concept of balance is just incredibly important and it ties to your goals. So the longer your goal, the longer time frame you have to achieve your goals, the more risk you can take and therefore the more your balance can shift toward the stock market versus the bond market versus any other asset class you may be thinking about because stocks historically have the highest return and bonds have the next highest and cash has the lowest. And you know you can fit real estate in there if you want, it's somewhere in between, but stocks, bonds, cash is actually a really good way to think about it. So you think about stocks over the last 100 years or so have averaged about 10% a year, bonds have averaged about six, and cash has averaged about two. And so as you, the longer you have, the more you obviously wanna to shift toward that class that earns 10% as opposed to the two, but that 10% comes with big ups and big downs. And you see that every day in the stock market. Sometimes the, mar you know, the market was up 1% today, a couple of days ago it was down 2%. And you have to be prepared for that kind of volatility if you're only investing for the short term. So uh, balance, second most, you know, as I said, one of the two most difficult concepts. Cost, I think this one is relatively simple. This, this is the lower the cost of the investment, the more you get to keep. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, that's not true in most consumer markets. Usually when I pay more, I get more. So it's interesting, Morningstar, Schwab, um, Vanguard, you know, different companies have done studies on this. The single best predictor of an investment long-term record is its cost. So this is, this is a situation where the more you pay, the less likely you are to outperform. And so it's not like, like when you're buying a car, you know, if you were to uh, contrast, okay, I'm gonna buy a, an entry level Kia or I'm gonna buy a BMW 7 Series. You know, the difference in cost there is huge. Now there's a difference in performance as well. So you're gonna be balancing, well, the BMW has much better performance, it's much more comfortable, but boy, I'm paying a lot. But that's a value judgment, right? In investing, you buy the BMW, you're gonna get smoked by the Kia in the investment, from an investment return standpoint, which is really hard to sort of sometimes get your head around. And you see an example of that here in this chart. 
And then finally, the fourth principle is uh, discipline. And this again, along with the balance, this is the hardest one because people don't always approach the markets from a purely rational perspective. We're all humans, we're, and so we're driven a little bit by emotion. So um, this chart um, is a particular favorite of mine because um, as Maddie said, I became CEO at Vanguard in August of 2008. In, the market immediately began an absolute crash where it dropped 55% in six months. I had a few of my colleagues looking at me going, cause and effect here, you know, you're the new guy and the market goes down 55%. It was not particularly um, gratifying to, to hear those comments, but you know, the market was uh, unbelievably brutal in 2008. And so we had, you can see where that, if you started at the end of 07 with $100, how, how far you drop, you dropped to about 60, and this is a portfolio of stocks, bonds, and cash, and then you can see what's happened. So I always like to say this was my mom, because my mom started out with $100, and I can tell you exactly where that bottom point is. It was March 9th of 2009, and on March 9th, my mother calls me, and she says, I can't take it anymore. I'm selling all our stocks. And I'm like, well, mom, like three months ago, you loved all your, you loved your stock portfolios and you know, you had a hundred dollars and she goes, but I don't have a hundred dollars anymore. It's, it's down. And the stock part of this was actually down more than these numbers suggest. It was actually down 50% at that point. And so she's, I, I can't take it. I'm going to sell and I'm going to go to cash. So if she had done that, her hundred dollars today in 2021, would be worth roughly $66, right? Think about that. She basically would have locked in her loss and never recovered. If she had said, okay, I'm gonna put it all into bonds, she would have, you know, she'd be up almost back to where she started. But by staying in stocks, and riding out the tremendous pain, you know, today if you're 60, 40, you know, if you had ridden through this whole thing with a, a balanced portfolio, not even all in stocks, if you were all in stocks, the number would be even higher. If you just rode through it all, you would literally be up 200% in that period of time, which is a pretty good return. So the lesson here really was you could not let the emotion dictate what you did. And I gotta tell you, it was incredibly, it's very, as, as Buffett said, it's really simple, but this was the thing that really broke our hearts at Vanguard because we saw so many investors, professionals, individuals, companies, endowments, foundations, all hit the panic button and wanna move their money out of the market, basically locking in the loss. So this again, uh, this discipline, this ability to stay the course, if you will, through really difficult times, and I got to tell you, emotionally, it's really hard to do. But if you can do it, that's actually how you make money in the market. Okay? That, it's that ability to sort of withstand that. And it's why it's so important to have a very long-term view. Now, I would tell you, if your goal is short-term, then you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't have this much money in the stock markets anyway. So again, this was, I'm, I'm really talking here about people with long-term goals. So um, those four principles are really key. And I would just throw in a bonus principle, which is hopefully applicable to all you. Start early. So here's a quiz. So Will, this is one of my friend's sons, we, when we were sort of working on our investment thesis together, he, uh, Will started saving at age 30. So he waited, actually, he's not, not as young as you guys. And he put in $10,000 a year for 10 years, and then he stops. Okay, so he put in $100,000 over 10 years. His brother Connor waited till he was 40, and for the next 25 years put in $10,000. And so he cumulatively put in 250,000. So who has the most money today? Will does, okay? Will does, because 
that power of compounding, that extra 10 years of just earning returns on your money. He invested far less, but because of the power of compounding, that extra 10 years gave him an extraordinary advantage. Think about that. It's a $300,000 difference. And he invested $150,000 less than his brother. The math is absolutely overwhelming. I, I remember um, Albert Einstein, who's not particularly well known for investing. Um, he said the most magical property in the entire universe. So this is the guy who invented the theory of relativity, right? He said the most magical property in the universe is the power of compounding. And this is it. I mean, because again, it's counterintuitive to most people. It's counterintuitive. So um, this story, this uh, Will and Connor, actually comes, as I said, from one of my colleagues. And my colleague's name uh, is Jack Brennan, who was my predecessor and great, um, you know, absolutely a great mentor. And he wrote this book called Straight Talk on Investing and Lessons of a Lifetime. And he just came out with a new edition. We're going to actually raffle off a few at the end. Um, but I would tell you, if you don't win it in the raffle, if you want the single best book, and there's a thousand of them out there, but if you want the single best book that just has the basics of investing and you follow it, this is the one to do. And it's not, by, by the way, it's not the best seller. It's not the most famous. There's so many other people out there with bigger names uh, than Jack who, who, you know, wrote decent books. This one, though, is the one I give to my kids, the one I give to all my friends, because if you follow it, it's just a great blueprint, and it's very real, and it's very practical. So I'm going to stop there. As I said, I wanted to get through this part relatively quickly, because what I really want to do is just let you guys ask me whatever's on your mind. And as I said, we can talk about the markets, we can go into some of these principles in more detail, or... We can talk about anything else in corporate life that you're interested in or any other subject for that matter. Um, I'm, I'm game. So we're going to start and somebody will have to ask that first question and then we'll go from there. I see a hand over, way over there. Uh, what are your, like, what's your personal opinion for investing in like cryptocurrency? compared to like the traditional stock market? Yeah, so cryptocurrency. Do we have any cryptocurrency investors here? I, I, I figured you might be because uh, you're asking the question. So um, this will sound sacrilegious. I think it's a religious conviction one way or the other. Like you either believe in it or you don't. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, cryptocurrency has no intrinsic value, all right? So the thing about a stock, so many of you who aren't business majors, you, you may not know this, but all a stock price represents is the earnings of a company, sort of the future earnings of the company, and it's a present value of those earnings. So if, you know, when you look at Amazon's stock price, it's basically in, the market has, is saying Amazon's going to make X billions of dollars, actually trillion now, in the future. And that's what the company's worth. When you, buy, when you own a bond, it's like a loan. Like you have lent money through the bond to a company and the company has agreed to pay you that money back and pay you interest for um, the privilege of using that money. So the difference with crypto is, crypto is just like currency. It's like investing in pounds. It's like investing in Swiss francs. And what you're basically betting on is that it's going to appreciate more rapidly or differently than a dollar. Um, and you know, that to me is what I, I, I would term that speculation as opposed to pure investing, because you're basically just making a bet about the value of one currency versus another. Now, I will say, um, and I, I don't want to, so I don't want to come across as negative on the technology behind it. I think blockchain, which is the technology behind crypto, is one of the most important technologies of the future. And I actually think digital currencies are going to become more accepted. But I'm waiting for like the Chinese, you know, um, currency, the dollar, the UK pound, all to have digital versions, if you will. Um, and that to me will be really when it, it becomes interesting. Right now, to me, it's just a pure speculative game. Yeah. 
Oh, if I could go back and give advice to myself when I was in college. Well, the first one would be study harder. Um, as, I, as I alluded to, I probably spent a little more time on the river than I should have. Um, you know, I, I think the, the biggest, um, if I could go back, I probably would take, and this is gonna sound maybe counterintuitive, I would actually take bro a broader array of courses. So, you know, one of the things um, that you're gonna hear a lot as you go out professionally, um, you know, when you graduate, you feel like, oh, you know, I've accomplished a lot and you know, maybe I gotta go get an advanced degree, maybe not, but I've, I've accomplished a lot, I've learned a lot. Well, I would say you're just at the beginning. And the, what really separates people professionally is the ability to keep learning. And so this being incredibly curious about things and always looking to learn the next new thing in whatever subject is really important. And I think in college, I was pretty focused on, you know, a, a narrower, like, okay, I'm gonna major in this, I'm gonna do this, and that, that's gonna lead to this. I think I would go back and try to be a little bit more open-minded about what I took, and because it, I think it would have fostered that sense of curiosity a little bit better. Um, so it's one of the things I've tried to do, you know, professionally is really stay plugged into a wide array of things, so that um, I'm constantly learning new things. You know, I retired from Vanguard three years ago, I guess now, and I'm in new things right now where I'm, I'm, like, a, I'm like a second grader compared to the professionals in, in, in these different things I'm involved in. And it is so much fun because it's just like, I feel like I'm constantly in a classroom and I wish I could have sort of had that mentality when I was in college. What else? I'll bring the mic over to you. Um, what are your thoughts on the real estate market and do you see a crash coming in the near future? Yeah, um, great question um, as well. Um, so the real estate market is one where there's a ton of speculation, right, um, about what's going to happen. So um, again, when I think about investing, um, real estate's a tough one because it's, for me, it's, it's a very, very long-term play. And so if you're going to be a real estate investor, you have to do it, you have to have a very long time frame, and you also have to have real comfort with not having liquidity. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, the great thing about stock market or the bond market is if tomorrow you need cash, you can sell and there's a price and you, you get it. In real estate, sometimes there's no takers. Like you can put stuff, you know, you can put stuff on the market and you just can't sell it doesn't feel like, you know, if, if you've looked at residential real estate recently, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like everything just goes up forever. But there are huge periods of time where there's no liquidity in the real estate market. So look, um, do I think there's a crash? Um, you know, interestingly, a year ago, I thought, I, I, I'm not sure I would have called it a crash, but I thought there was going to be a really major correction, especially in the commercial side, because of this, you know, COVID. I, I thought you would see companies really rethinking their flexibility and where people work. And that is definitely happening, but it's happening more on the margin than I thought. Um, most organizations that I've talked to really are back to, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna have more flexibility than we used to, but we still need big physical plants because we want our people together, because we want collaboration, we want culture, we want um, just the human interaction that people really crave. And I think this last six months in particular, we, I've seen a little bit of a bounce back toward you know, um, people actually opening new office space and so forth. So look, I don't know whether there'll be a big correction or not. Uh, could there be some correction? Sure, because maybe we'll need a little less commercial real estate than we did. But in the end, I still think people, I still think people value the in-person um, relationships that they develop. I think you'll see companies be way more flexible in terms of time in the office versus time out, but I don't think the office is gonna go away. And, and I think people thought that maybe a year ago and I think they're wrong. But well, you know, you, you guys probably have as good a sense of that as I do. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so what's a good starting point for somebody completely new to investing? Um, again, something I probably should have um, included here. That's, a, 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 again, a really good question. So what I, I would tell you, the best way to start is just to start, right? Like, get involved. What I would do if, if I'm, if I'm going to put my, I call it my serious money, like, so I'm just starting out and that's all I've got, I would put it in broad-based index funds. And, you know, buy an ETF, you pay like three basis points for it um, and buy the whole market, you know, buy either the whole U.S. market or the whole world market. And that way you have the most diversified portfolio on the planet for almost no price. And over the long run, it'll do really, really well. It'll probably beat 90% of, you know, so-called managed funds that are trying to beat the market. So that's how I would start. If you... You know, the, we, we, I saw a handful uh, of people who said they use Robinhood, and you know, which by definition you're buying individual stocks and so forth. If you want to get into individual stocks, I, I always encourage people to do it, but do it with money that you know you can lose. Um, so, what, you know, and again, I keep coming back to my mom. So what we finally figured out with my mom was we took 90% of what she had saved, my mom and dad, and we put it in highly diversified index funds, really broad based, and that just, you know, has kept growing over time. It's been, the power of compounding has worked for the last 35 years. We took a little piece of it, though, put it in a brokerage account, said, Mom, trade away. And she had a blast. You know, she's buying stocks. She's selling stocks. And, you know, when you look at the net performance, it's not as good as just being in a broad index fund. But she's had an incredibly fun time doing it. She's intellectually engaged. And she's learned a ton about the market by doing it in different companies. And I actually think it's a really good model. So what I would say is, you know, if you've got some fun money and you want to play with individual stocks, that's great. But just be prepared. Know you could lose it all. But if you've if you got your serious money, put it in a broad-based index fund and, you know, just kind of set it and forget it. Yeah. Hello. Uh, what are some daily habits you recommend to students who are about to graduate and enter the workforce? Uh, what are some habits that oh, you recommend? Habits. Yeah. Um, so look, uh, you know, this is one of these questions that I think is really hard um, when you're just coming out of school because you're trying to figure everything out. Um, and work becomes, look, work becomes a really important part of who you are and what you do and, and how much time you spend. So I, I like to break it into two components, okay? So the first thing I would say um, from a habit standpoint is, and this is going to sound a little bit philosophical, which you've probably gotten a, the, a, the bent that I'm, I like to think that way. I would look at four categories of life. I would look at family. I'd look at work. I'd look at community, meaning my friends and interactions where I live, and I'd look at personal, mind, body, spirit. I'd think about those four categories, um, and I'd think about what do I kind of want to get done in each of those categories. And at different points in your life, like when I was first coming out of college, you know, family was, I want to get home for Christmas and Thanksgiving. That was about it. Like, I, you know, I wasn't engaged, I wasn't married or anything like that. Obviously, with kids and everything, that changes. So, um, but you go through each of those and just with, like, what are the one or two things in each of those categories that I'd kind of like to do? And then when you get to the work part, um, you know, probably the single best advice I ever got was to pay attention to time and how do you spend your time? And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I had a boss early in my career at Vanguard who actually made us track our time because we were a project team and it was almost like and, and, and I was so insulted by it. Like, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm just being paid by the hour here. And, you know, I'm, I'm having to track everything I do. Turned out to be like the best habit I ever got into. And you didn't have to be microscopically um, perfect in your measurement. But having a sense of how I spent my time turned out to be unbelievably important. And, you know, when I... Um, when I'd been uh, CEO for about a year, I went to, up to Harvard Business School. They were doing a huge study on how CEOs spent their time. And I could literally lay out charts of, you know, for years of just, you know, how much time I spent with clients, how much time I spent on personnel issues, how much time I spent with investors talking about the markets, how much time I spent traveling, you know sort of the big categories, if you will, and being very strategic about that over time 
really helped because what you find when you pay attention to time that way, you actually find, uh, gosh, I'm, I may be wasting a little bit more time or not spending it as productively as I could. Sometimes that's the, you know, the organization you're part of and what they ask you to do, but sometimes it's just your own habits. And so really getting um, pretty scientific about that actually turned out to be incredibly liberating over time. And it allowed me to really spend my time where I could add the most value. Yeah. Uh, one thing I learned at entry level and one thing I learned at CEO. So phew, limiting it to one, huh? Okay. So when I, when I first started out, the most important advice I got was, and this again sounds counterintuitive, don't worry about the next job. Like, um, and, and it's interesting, when I, when I talk to a lot of young Vanguard associates when they first come in, they all have these career paths in mind because that's how they've been coached. And they all want to talk about, you know, what's it take to get promoted, what's it take to, to move ahead and so forth. Um, the best advice I ever got was embrace the job that you have and do it as hard and as well as you possibly can. Sort of live in the moment and just be really good at it. And if you're really good at it, somebody's going to notice and all of a sudden you're going to have more opportunities. And interestingly, all the best opportunities I ever got as I moved up were total surprises. Like somebody would come to me and say, hey, you know, you did a really good job over here. We want you to go do this. And it was not having, I, it was literally just focused on that current job. So that, that's probably the single most important thing I learned at the, you know, right getting, you know, when I started. And by the way, you know, coming out of business school, that was not the way we all were sort of trained to think and the way everybody talked about, well, at 18 months, I've got to be a, you know, I got to be an assistant treasurer and then I've got to be a second vice president. Then I got to be a vice, you know, everybody had this plan and um, it turned out just focus on doing a great job and you actually could separate yourself from others. You know, at CEO, um, the most important thing is it's not about you. It's, it's really to surround yourself with incredibly talented people who are all smarter than you are and do lots of things better than you do and really create a high performing team and let them do their thing. And, you know, you're there to clear away obstacles. You're there to break ties when you got debates going on. But at the end of the day, having unbelievably great people who were just, you know, driven to do the right thing for investors, um, as I talked about earlier, and just not getting in their way was really, really important. And, you know, the, the sort of the corollary to it was, you know, you, the, your stereotype of like the most successful CEOs are, you know, they're out there on stage and they're really, you know, they're basically dictating, you know, here's what you do and here's the vision. And choo, choo, choo. Actually, the best CEOs I know just sit there and they ask, they'll ask some questions, but they just listen. And they listen really intently because they surrounded themselves with great teams. Um, single best CEO I've ever been exposed to um, was a guy you, most of you probably never heard of. His name is Steve Hemsley. He ran United Healthcare for about 15 years. He's the most humble. Um, you, you would never know he ran the fifth largest company in America because he doesn't say a lot. But when he speaks, it's really, it's really meaningful but he surrounded him himself with an unbelievable team and you know he really empowered them to do great things and the company's achieved uh, unbelievable un achieved unbelievable success when he was the leader what else yeah so i I've, I've had money problems for a little bit but i've been considering like getting more into pay trading what are your Day trading? Yeah. So, um, it's really a popular idea right now. The Robin Hoods of the world and some of the other um, discount brokers really promote it. All I can tell you is the more people who go into day trading, the more excited the professional investors get. Because the math is so overwhelming against you. So, Again, let me give you 
just practical. I'm going to give you two. I'm going to give you two data points. Okay. So the first one is, you know, most of the day traders I know, and I have some friends who've done this. You know, they tune into CNBC, they listen to Jim Cramer, they listen to, you know, they read a bunch of blogs. They, they spend a few hours doing it. I got, I had the privilege of working with 30 different global firms who were trying to beat the market. Um, about half of them were successful and they were successful by about a half a percentage point to a percentage point a year, which is a lot of money over time. But you know, if the market was up 10, they were up 11. They worked 100 hour weeks for 30 years and that's what they were able to do. And so when I watch the Kramers of the world and you know, some of what they're promoting, the idea that you can compete with those guys with just a couple hours, I think it's really hard. Um, so that's the philosophical um, point, if you will. So the data are this. Um, at the end of the day, the stock market, let's say we just take the entire stock market, okay? Um, and the stock market, let's say on average over the last 80 years has returned 10%. So um, if you outperform, somebody else underperforms because at the end of the day, it's a zero sum game. And when you add in the costs of trading and so forth, and again, none of that stuff is totally free. I mean, you don't pay actual explicit fees, but you're paying implicitly, as you know, you know, the bid ask spread or whatever. Um, in the end, um, the market's gonna be the market. So if there are a handful of people who beat the market, then there's a lot of other people who've gotta not beat the market. And this has been the hard thing. You know, the professionals in the world, um, when Vanguard came around and introduced the idea of indexing, everybody said, well, who wants to be average? And I said, if you have an index return, you're not average. By definition, you're gonna be in the 90th percentile. You won't be in the 100th, but you'll always be in the 90th. And they're like, that can't be. And I, I said, absolutely it can be because an index fund basically mirrors the market and an active manager who charges a fee um, is starting the market minus one and they have to overcome that, let's say. And collectively they can't. So um, in the end, the math is really against, is, is really against people making money. Now, there will be somebody who will be really successful, but for every guy who you know, beats the market by 5% a year, the math is, everybody else collectively has to underperform by 5% so he can do that. So you just have to know that going in and you have to be very humble about it. And as, as I was saying before on how to get started, if you wanna play in, in, in that kind of space, do it with money that you know you can lose and do it with money you know that if you underperform, it's not the end of the world. Um, but, it, it's one of those, it's, it's, it's really, it's a difficult concept because we're all born competitive. We all think we can beat the market. Um, when I was coming out of school, I was pretty convinced I could pick stocks better than anybody. And I'm here to tell you, you know, if you spend a hundred hour, if you spend a hundred hours a week trying to pick the best stocks, you might beat the market by 1% a year if you're a legend. And literally the guys we talk about, the, you know, the, the legendary investors, that's what they do. Now, there are other ways to earn higher returns in the stock market, you know, being in the private markets or, you know, um, you know, being in venture capital, things like that. That's a whole different topic. Yeah. Uh, just that way, what you were saying about um, the the market really the third for the uber wealthy because new people coming in are yeah. So the question is, is it, isn't it just really a pyramid scheme and it's really difficult for new investors? So here, here's the, 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 the answer would be yes, except um, companies are always growing. So um, when you look at, let's just use the S&P 500 as a proxy for the market. It's not quite, it's, you know, there's more companies than that. But on average, those companies grow, you know, seven, eight percent a year. And then they also, have, you know, they gain in productivity and so forth. So when you look at the profit growth in, in, the, in, the, in those companies, they're actually, over time, they've earned more and more and more as they've gotten bigger and more successful and so forth. And so the stock market today is 
there's really two components, right? There's the future earnings, that I, which I'm describing, the growth, and then there's what multiple will you pay for that? Now, that's where there's a speculative element to it. So it, on your question, the market today is really expensive because interest rates are so low. Um, if interest rates were to go up, the market might become a little, the, the market might react to that negatively. But the market can continue to grow as the economy grows. It's basically a reflection of growth of, of the global economy and productivity gains. So there's no reason. So, you know, when I started out, you know, the Dow Jones was well under 1,000 when I started at Vanguard. It was like 700 or something. And the Dow Jones is today 35,000. Um, that's not that's not just buying and selling. That's actually true growth in the economy and growth in GDP and growth in earnings. So I don't know if that makes sense. But so, you know, in a pyramid scheme, you, you, when I say zero sum game, what I mean is the, ret the broad return of the market is going to be whatever it is. It's the collection of all investors. And if somebody beats the market, then somebody else has to underperform the market because in the in the end you can only be what the market is you know if you're every stock in the world so let's just do an experiment um, we've got you guys are all investors right and we're going to say you all you all represent the market okay so and the market collectively earns 10 percent if this half of the room and let's say it's half the people in this room earns nine What's this half going to earn? I heard it somewhere. 11, all right? So 50% of 11 and 50% of nine adds up to 10. So if, if this group just couldn't pick the right stocks, couldn't match the market's return, collectively this group would actually have the opportunity to outperform. So that's when I say zero sum, that's really what I mean. It doesn't mean that it, the whole thing's not growing though. Does that make sense? What else? Yeah. Yeah. So um, advice for short-term investing. So, um, you know, if you have a goal that's less than 10 years and you, I, there's probably a couple of categories there. If you really can't afford to lose much, then you want to be in like short-term bonds. And unfortunately, the returns on that aren't great. You know, you're probably going to make a couple percent a year, but you, you can't afford the swings in the stock market. The closer you get out to 10 years, the more you can have at least a higher percentage in stocks. So let's say if you were truly 10 years, you know, being half in stocks and half in bonds would probably not be a bad mix. Yeah. Um, what in your eyes is the importance of money to society the motivation So, um, you know, what, 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 like paper currency? Yeah, what, what, what makes it valuable? What makes it valuable is um, the fact that the U.S. government prints it and backs it. Um, you know, it's a, so it's a really good question because, you know, we get into this, you get into a lot of debates about, you know, why aren't we gold-based anymore? Um, you know, if you think about, if, if you think about cash in general, and we're gonna get back to the crypto question in a second here, because there is a relationship. You know, money is just to facilitate barter. You know, at the end of the day, you know, when we started out with sort of a commercial society, you know, you, you might grow corn and I might produce wool by, you know, grow, you know, raising a couple sheep and shearing them. And we would trade, you know, you, you'd say, I want, you know, this much wool and I'll give you eight years of corn and we go back and forth. And all, all paper currency does is make that easier, right? So it's in a sense, in and of itself, it's not worth anything. It's just really a medium for exchange. And that's where, you know, the, gold, you know, the so-called gold bugs kind of miss it. Um, and, you know, the return to the gold standard. I mean, gold has no intrinsic value either. I mean, 
it's not a particularly valuable mineral. Um, doesn't do anything. Like it's not an important part of compo uh, electronic components. Yeah. It doesn't produce, you know, growth or anything. So um, it really was just a store of value. And and and, and paper currency is really just a, a, a more facile way of doing that. You know, that's essentially what crypto is. Um, the difference is it's not it's not backed by a government. So the whole supply and demand thing is artificially controlled. And that's where some of the issues have arisen. But the, the technology underneath it, blockchain, if you understand blockchain, blockchain is essentially a barter system, all right? You're creating these ledgers that are incredibly, um, in, in theory, um, you know, they can't be, you know, the, the cryptology can't be broken. And so you and I can do barter through that mechanism. And what you're seeing is you're actually seeing companies adopt blockchain for inventory management and things like that where you know they can exchange goods um, without actually having to use cash so I mean it's just one use but it's it's it, at the end of the day that's really all that you, that dollar bill represents and uh, you know the, the the thing about the US dollar is um, it's only as good as the sovereignty of the US okay so when you, you know, when people get nervous about the dollar, they're really nervous about the U.S. All right, guys, we'll take one more question and then wrap it up. Yeah, we'll get, he gets a follow-up. Well, so I'm kind of saying it's a really important where I have What's that? Yeah, so that, that's probably one, what, that's probably a long philosophical conversation. Yeah, uh, but look, you know, at, at the end of the day, and this, it's actually an important element, um, and this is where, you know, there is some, I, I would say there's tension in society around this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the way markets generally work in, in, in the West, so let's take China out of it. So in the developed West, you know, basically what you get paid is what the marketplace broadly is willing to pay for a set of services. So, you know, if you're, if, if, if you are um, Ben Simmons, to use a Philadelphia example, you know, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm, yeah. So, you know, what, what, you know, how do you mathematically come up with $160 million over four years for an NBA player, right? But that's what the marketplace has determined. And it's determined that because, you know, it's a whole series of factors, you know, how much what does one player drive attendance? How much does success drive attendance? How much does it drive jersey sales? You, you, know, you know all the ancillary stuff. So there is actually an underlying logic to it. It's the same thing with, you know, if you, if you look at other function, you know, other roles, it's how much does the marketplace value what's being produced by that type of work? Sometimes, I think to all of us, it seems like it's completely skewed, right? Like, why does this particular um, set of activities seem to command a higher salary than this set of activities? It's, at the end of the day, mostly because that's what a broad marketplace is, quote unquote, willing to pay for it. Um, it doesn't mean it's perfect, by the way. It's, you know, one of the hard things about market-based systems. The, the, those, those of us who believe in market-based systems believe in the market is actually better at doing that than some one person determining, oh, I think this is more valuable than that, so that's what it's going to be. And that's really, again, comes down to a very philosophical statement at the end of the day. I'd love to, I could, follow, I could talk about this all night, so, um, but for the rest of you, I know some of you, like, got to go get dinner, just finish practice, maybe have some homework, so... I'm gonna say thank you very much. You guys have been great. Great set of questions, thanks.
Um, Thank you, Mr. McNabb, for your informative and interesting presentation. Your candor and honesty is illuminating, and tonight we've clearly learned some very thought-provoking and motivating pointers on leadership as well as financial insights. As a token of our appreciation, we would like to give you a couple gifts. We have uh, some flowers that we would uh, ask you to pass along to your wife, as we know she was influential in bringing you in today. We can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. All business majors, make sure you guys sign in at the front if you didn't already to make sure your attendance is here. And let's give it up for Mr. McNabb one last time. Thank you. That concludes it, everyone. Thank you.